Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, I think you can see my presentation. Uh, we will start the session. I will be covering leadership, motivation, and decision making to the extent uh, the time permits. So uh, we will start with leadership. Sorry, it's not working. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to introduce the concept of manager and the leader as the beginning point. Now, manager... Uh, of an organization looks at the operational side of the organization, whereas the leader looks at the strategic side of the organization. So uh, they play two different roles. That is the first message I would like to give you. Uh, when it comes to leadership, it is necessary that we differentiate a leader from a manager. Manager normally looks after day-to-day -day affairs of an organization. That is what we call operational part of the organization. Whereas the leader look at what are the changes or what are the improvements that has to come in into the organization. So while uh, manager is looking at the day-to-day -day affairs, leader is looking at the changes, possible changes. Uh, therefore, Manager always build up transactional relationships. That means he gets some work done and he pay for the work carried out. So it's a give and take relationship. Uh, so he will pay to the extent that the work is performed. Whereas the leader is different. He will invest money without the assurance of a return. Uh, in order to change a person, maybe he, he will invest on the uh, capacity building of a person. Uh, he may uh, invest on uh, skill development. So it's an investment, not give and take relationship, transformational relationship. Then uh, the other one is manager value tradition because he is to continue the practices that had been there. So he's, so he's normally past oriented and he will try out only the time tested things, not anything new. Whereas the leader is the opposite. He questioned the tradition, he's future oriented and he looks for innovations something new, something that had not been tested earlier. Uh, therefore, the manager appreciate obedience from the workers, whereas leader want them to question because questioning only will open up avenues to change. If you take up, take the whole thing, the manager's idea is to retain and use what is there, what is already there in the organization. <coughs> so, whereas leader want to create what is not there. So you can see a vast difference, 180 degree turn between a manager and a leader. There are still more. Manager will focus on controlling expenditure. Leader will concentrate on revenue generation. Now, these are two different things. To generate revenue, you have to spend money. If you curtail your expenditure, probably your revenue is going to get affected. So one single person cannot do this. So controlling expenditure, 
becomes manager's responsibility, but generating revenue will be the leader's responsibility. Now, if you really look at uh, the traditional home, you would realize that mother and father divided the roles among themselves in the same lines. I would say not in a contemporary home, but in a traditional home. Mother was assuming the role of the manager, whereas father assumed the role of a leader. So manager was always looking at the inside, at the inside of the organization. So we say he's not only past oriented, but he's internally oriented. But leader could, cannot do that. He has to look at outside of the organization. What is happening in the outer world? Uh, what are the new technological developments? What are the political trends? What are the what is the economy doing right now? What are the social uh, upheavals that are expected? Social changes that are expected? Why he has to align the organization to suit that external world. That is the strategic role. <clears throat> so he has to be externally oriented. The manager, people say, is defensive in actions. He wait till things come to his hand. Very pessimistic person. Whereas a leader is offensive in action. He goes out to the world. Uh, to fetch things for the organization. Whereas manager will try to avoid external influences and try to protect the organization by being defensive. <coughs> now, uh, in the same spirit, uh, manager consider mistakes as sins that should be avoided. Whereas a leader consider mistakes as essential to learning. Uh, now you would realize why leader think mistakes in that particular way. Innovation, new things always carry a risk of failure. So if you don't allow mistakes to happen, there won't be any innovation in the organization. So therefore, he will be all out protecting people who do mistakes while they innovate. Whereas money manager does not want innovation. He wants the status quo to be maintained. Stability and order is his main intention. Whereas leader will look at the growth, advancement of the organization. So, uh, so now you, you, you would realize that these two roles, both are important and has to be played by two different individuals. If you take a private sector organization, you will see the board of directors performing the role of a leader, whereas general manager probably is looking after the operation part of it. So uh, there, there, there are distinct uh, roles. But the problem of our country is we have managers, but we don't have enough leaders. So you would realize now, this could be equated in the way we look at the economy also. Uh, the, the people who have a managerial mentality will go for import restrictions to protect, to defend the country, to defend the local production. He would like to have import restrictions, whereas leader would want to have a free economy where, where uh, he could go out to the world, sell products to the world market and earn revenue earn revenue. So uh, if you look at the mentality of these particular individuals, they will be promoting two different 
economic policies for the country if they become leaders. A manager, import restrictions, a leader, a free market economy, especially export oriented economy where uh, we would produce for the world market. Uh, now, this is the first message I would like to share with you about leadership. So there are a few messages. The two roles are important. Uh, two roles have to be played by two different individuals. And uh, uh, what we find in Sri Lanka is there are managers, enough managers, but there are few leaders. So therefore, we have a problem right now. Uh, any questions that you like to raise with regard to my first message? I would like one of you to respond. Otherwise, I don't know whether you are in the audience, whether you are with me or... Are you okay with the explanation? Yes? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Now I am going to talk about some of the myths and truths about leadership. Actually, I would call them half truths, not purely myths, not purely truthful. Okay, what are those? There is a belief that leaders are born. That means it's an inherited talent. So uh, the, the, this particular belief prevents some of us to become leaders. Now say, for example, if my father has not played a leadership role in his career, probably I may consider myself as not suitable because I, I don't come in a family where leadership was present. They should be supermen. They should have the ability to show how something should be done. Now, only a superman can do that. Now, for example, if I am a CEO of an organization, I may have an IT manager, I may have a finance manager, but I will not be able to show them how a profit and loss account can be done or how data security can be established. Because I'm no expert in those areas. I know little about that, but I'm not a superman who can show everyone else how to do things. No, I cannot. So am I not a leader? Have I failed? Now, these are the questions. Number three, should be charismatic. What do you say charismatic? Should be very attractive personality. With a, with a big moustache and a big belly, a personality. Should be like a Kesar Singh, like a lion. Again, if you look at some of the leaders in the world, you may find they are not charismatic. Take, for example, Gandhi. If you have not seen a photograph of Gandhi, and if you are seeing the photograph for the first time, you would realize that you, you, you would come to identify him as a bigger, bigger. Identify him as a bigger, not as a leader. Because he, he, does, he does not have the personality of a leader, according to the beliefs of certain people. It is not good enough to become a male, but it, you have to be an alpha male. Somebody very strong, awful. Then there is another belief that the leader should be a saint. 
who observe sil for on four days, who go to temple, who go to church, who uh, who listen to bana, but never do bad things. Bad things like drinking alcohol, uh, smoking, or, or going after ladies, mistresses, or, or the other way around. Not doing bad things should be saint. Now, if you really look at, none of these are true. They can be groomed. Yes, you need certain amount of genes, some amount of uh, capabilities to become a leader, but most of the average people can be groomed to become leaders. They should be supermen. No. They cannot learn everything in this world. They, they must bank on others. That is the leadership. They should be charismatic. No. They should be pleasant and accessible. That is good enough. Prasanna penumati nona langwenna puluang kamati nona minisud. They should be saints. No, not necessary. But they should have certain values which are uncompromising. For example, a mafia leader, not a saint. He will kill anybody who betrays the organization. That is his value. And that applies to his children as well. If son betrays, he will kill the son. Uncompromising value. Not a saint. So you can see these are only half truths. So now see, this is the second message I would like to give you. Now if you are asked in the exam uh, telling some of these statements and try to analyze those, I hope you would be in a position to do it. Criticize the statement or critically analyze the statement. Probably you can do it. If you are asked to differentiate between a manager and a leader, probably you will be able to do it now. Right. So the, the second message. And are there any questions? Remember, I did not consider these as myths or truths but only half truths. Right. So then we will go into the next one. Yes, they need not, they need not be born as leaders, may not be supermen, charismatic, and saints, but, but, but what? But they should be brave. To do what? Take up challenges and ready to fail. That is the most important thing. A leader should be brave enough to take up challenges and ready to fail. What does that mean? Not to jump into a crisis like a fool. That is not taking up challenges. You do a risk analysis. Take a stock of calculated risks and then take up the challenge. That ability is the primary ability, primary attribute of a leader. To be brave, to fail, to fail, the most important thing to fail. Learn quickly from failure and able to stand up. Yes, able to get people to share his dream or her dream and work with them to realize those dreams. It is your dream that is going to be the dream of your team. You should be able to get people to share your dreams. Those are the primary attributes of a leader. Now, uh, you would have heard a, a very attractive statement. Cream of the class has to get orders from 
the last in the class who become politicians or the businessmen. We are the cream, the engineers, the doctors also are considered cream of the class. And unfortunately, we have to get guidance, instructions from people who had been last in the class, now become politicians and businessmen. I also thought this is unfortunate, but this is the truth. Why it is so? Can anybody tell me why we are in this boat right now? We are being guided by lasting the class. Any guess? So that I know that you are listening to me. You are alive. What do you think? What is the reason? Nobody? Sir, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Kamal, yes. Yes, uh, sir, uh, the businessman uh, uh, started the factory or, uh, factory or uh, any organization. Then uh, as engineers, we have to work uh, under them. Uh, then uh, we have to follow their guidance. Exactly. So wh why the engineers can't do it? Or, or, or they, they are reluctant to do it. Why, why they are reluctant? I think so. most of the cases uh, we are uh, afraid to take challenges because of the uh, risk of failure. The, <clears throat> the owners and uh, other things, uh, uh, not only the businessmen, other things, uh, we have to uh, hear to the uh, accountants also, Some because financial matters, uh, some we have to uh, work under their opinions also. Yeah. Okay, uh, basically, what uh, I think Kavindu was the person who said it, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we are, we are scared to take up challenges and uh, we are, there is the slightest possibility of failure because we have never failed in the class. Classic cream maker, you are scared to be a failure. You are scared to be a failure. Because you have never failed in life. Businessmen and politicians who are last in their class has always failed. They can fail another time. Now, this is where we have to shift our mode of thinking. Yeah. So, from half truths and half myths, I have come to the uh, the most uh, primary attribute um, to be brave. Second in, important leadership attribute, what is that? Swim against the tide to reach your destination. Swim against the tide to reach your destination. Don't allow the tide to take away you to an unpleasant destination with the tide and the crowd. Normally, that is what happens. Now, when, when you, are, uh, you are swimming against the tide, you are taking a risk. There is a possibility of failure. It is easier to, to go with the tide, go with the crowd. But remember this particular thing. If you want to please everyone, if you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader. Go sell ice cream. So if you are a leader, don't be scared to be different. Don't be scared to be different. Because your leadership role demands you to be different from the rest of the crowd. That is why they consider you a leader. You can't, you can't be synonymous with the crowd. 
synonymous with the team. You have to be special. <coughs> okay. Now the, the, the fourth message, that was the third message, uh, swimming against the tide and try to reach the destination that you desire. Okay, fourth message. Lead and follower are two roles which are not separable. They are like the sides of a coin, two sides of a coin. They can't be separated. If you separate leader from followers, there is no leader. Inseparable. At times, you need to be a follower in order to lead. This is the important statement. You need to be a follower in order to lead. Some followers are leaders in their own right. They may not have a leadership position. But they are leaders in their own right. Respect those people. Respect those people. That is the fifth or the fourth message. Okay. Now, let me uh, stop sharing this one and let me share video with you. Can you see the video? Sorry. Can you see the video leadership uh, session from Dancing Guy? Um, can, can you see the screen? Oh, yes. Sir. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we will open the video. Now, what is happening here? There is a person without a shirt and he's dancing on a picnic ground. Now, there is a possibility of failure. Sometimes nobody will join him and he may have, he may be labeled as a nut. He may have to withdraw. But he's taking a calculated risk. This is a picnic ground. There's always a possibility of people joining. He's taking that risk. Uh, now, did you realize that the second person also take a risk? Why? There is a nut who is dan dancing alone and the second person is also joining. There was only one nut earlier. Now there are two nuts. That will be the uh, perception of the other people. But he braved enough to be a follower and made a lone nut a leader. Now, this is what I want you to appreciate. The follower. Role of the follower. Okay. Mukhadu uh, Pamagarani, Pahanaka Hira, leader Nam, Eka Dalwana Gini Dalla Tamai. First follow, leader is the plinth of the land. Uh, what ignites the plinth is the follower. Okay. Uh, make a vista. Now, the person who is doing the commentary says that it is a turning point. Why it is a turning point? 
it is not not a leader and a follower but leader and a group a team so therefore he consider it as a turning point right let's see Earlier, he said the turning point. Now he says tipping point. What is tipping point? I think you know how a tipper operates. There is when when the angle is at right moment, everything in the tipper comes down in mass, not trickle down. Whole thing comes out. So there is no reversal once the tipping point is reached. It will not go back. Reverse when neither. Because now there are enough people, there is no risk in joining. Now anybody can join. Actually, those people who just do, do not join will be ridiculed for being sitting in a nice sunny day when all other people are dancing. Now see how things, things turn. Because of one shirtless guy who braved take up a challenge. Yes, the important point is what? Leadership is over-glorified. But it is over-glorified. Actually, he would have been a failure if not for the second person. The follower, first follower. Okay. So, uh, what is the message? Yes. Uh, what is the message after looking at uh, looking at the video? What do you think? What are the learning points? Leadership is over-glorified. First follower is underappreciated. But everything happened because of the because of the combination of the two. It's a joint effort. Right. And now we will go back to our main presentation. Uh, I was uh, I was once director center for housing planning and building. Uh, I think you you may be uh, you are aware of the organization. This is located in Palavatta, uh, and this is the training arm of the 
housing ministry, housing and construction ministry. So I was the director there. And when I was posted as the director, uh, within two weeks, I got a letter, in, invitation to participate in the construct exhibition. I think uh, you all know that there's an annual exhibition uh, called Construct at BMICH. That's a very huge exhibition where most of the players in the construction industry comes there and exhibit their products. And we were asked to uh, have a store. And it is given free of charge for us because it's a government organization in the construction industry. I was new to the subject. I was an irrigation engineer earlier. So I didn't know what to do about it. And I call a staff meeting. The best thing is to ask the people who have been there. So I asked them what to do. Now there's an invitation. Don't worry, sir. We have uh, already participated in the last few exhibitions. And there are posters that we have printed. And it's available with us. We can paste the posters in the wall of the stall. And we can have our leaflet training uh, literature on the table. Simple. So I went with the crowd. and. Uh, we were there. Nobody was interested in our stall because there were so many attractive stalls uh, produced, I mean, presenting uh, very attractive products. We had only papers. Uh, so one by one, my team, uh, they said, uh, I, sir, I will go there and come. And there was only one person with me now. He finally asked me, sir, can I go to the washroom? So I could not say no. And I was there, lonely, uh, director CHPB in, inside the stall. Nobody is coming. Uh, I felt awkward. So anyway, we managed to be there the three days. And uh, when I came back, I was thinking, uh, what went wrong? What is our role? Uh, actually, we are in the housing and construction industry. Uh, the problem of the country is that the people uh, don't have money to build houses and therefore they leave to Middle East to collect money. So it's a very pathetic story. So I thought, why not uh, CHPB help them in identifying low-cost housing technologies? Uh, so... Uh, you, you can see the exhibition hall uh, where there are competing products. And we went with the leaflet only. Now, I was not happy. I, I was thinking loudly of something, something afresh. Something that I could give to the people. A product. Not papers. So, I thought of a building model house deploying all the low-cost housing technologies in one single house so that people can come and experience the different house, wall panels and compare the costs, compare the labor, compare the implications and decide what, what should be adapted. So that was the concept I conceived uh, after the Construct exhibition, defeat. I call it a defeat. Failure. Complete failure. Now, uh, when I had this uh, idea in my mind, I called a staff meeting and told that I have this idea to build a model house. Then there was a very senior deputy director who had been there for 16 years. I was there for only a few months now. Two, three months. That deputy director asked me, where are you going to build the model house? I said, in the backyard. In the backyard, there is ample land. Then he said, no, sir, we are going to build a hostel. There are plans. I will show you the plans. So I had to withdraw. Uh, because uh, if, if the site is to be given to a hostel, Construction, I cannot build there. Obvious. But this idea, I shared with very uh, many others. And one person was the architect from NBRO, National Building Research Organization. 
His name uh, is Krishan Sugatapali, architect. So when I told him about this model house building, he said, I have the same dream. Why not we combine, joint and do, do it? So that was a great uh, relief for me. And, uh, but, uh, you know, after some time I thought, you know, people say these things, but they never come back, no? But Kishan was not that. He came with a plan. He came with a plan of a nice house. And he showed me the plan and said, we can build the model house using this plan. Are you okay with it? If you have any suggestions, I can change. I looked at the plan. It was nice. I said, no, I don't want a single revision. This is good enough. I like it. For a model house, this is the best plan somebody can produce. We will adapt it. So I, I call a staff meeting and then showed the plan and said, I'm going to build this, build this model house. Then uh, uh, the same question came where I said, yes, it is going to be a temporary affair. It's a temporary house construction. I will demolish it when the hostel is ready for construction. So it's a temporary thing. Now with that, I build up the house. This is the final house we build up together. But I would say this was not a very rosy journey. When I started construction, the foundation, nobody in the organization came to see the site. They were busy with their other work. Nobody was interested to see. But when the walls were coming up, one by one, there was one person who came and he looked at the two different walls and said, sir, can't we combine these two technologies? I said, great idea. So we, I called another staff meeting and I told my staff, now there, there are, when, I, when I was building the house, there was a proposal like this. You may also have some ideas. Why not you all contribute? Then they came up with so many. We had 10 different types of walls in this house. Now, uh, when the house was coming up, we wanted to have a low cost roof as well. So we went to uh, Dr. A. N. Kulasing. I think you would have heard about him. He's a great engineer the country had. He was experimenting on low-cost housing technologies at that time. So we went to his yard and we saw a nice roof coming up with three reapers. An eye section was formed out of the three reapers to make a rafter, two by four rafter. Civil engineers might know it. Uh, uh, this is a bit complicated because there has to be overlap, otherwise uh, it will collapse. So uh, somebody who is knowledgeable about this span, spans and bendy moments and all that, shear uh, forces and all that has to come in. So there was an engineer in my organization uh, who had a toolkit and he worked with the carpenter to complete the roof. Everything was fine. Then the tsunami struck the country, 2004. Uh, team from the Morotu University came to see us to see what we are doing for tsunami housing. And when, he, when they saw this, apart from the tsunami housing, they saw that the, the, this model house is coming up. They were fascinated about our experiment. And they said, we are ready to uh, test your wall panels in the Morotu University. Professor Chinta Jayasinghe was the uh, person who made it possible. So we, we tested these wall panels, five quarter inch thick wall panels in the Moroto University laboratory and found that it is the compressive strength is equal to a nine inch brick wall, standard brick wall. So now we had test results. And uh, you, you, you know, because the, most of the walls were constructed out of clay, it was thermally comfortable. Uh, even though the uh, roofing sheets were galvanized sheets. Uh, and you know, this house was built without 
destroy coral reefs, no lime, no lime. Without destroying our rivers, no sand. Without burning the jungle, no burnt bricks here. All were raw materials without lime, sand, and uh, burn, bur burning. Now, uh, there was a problem. When we wanted, now the next, uh, we were ready with the house for the next construct exhibition. But everything was in a mess. Now, to take photographs, we had to do some landscaping. There was a landscaping course in the CHPB at that time. The students in that course offered to do a landscape plan for the house. And they came up with the plan. And when they showed me, I thought it's marvelous. Uh, they, they, they told me that if you want, you can uh, change the plan. I said, no, I'm going to adapt this plan. Then they said, sir, we will put all the materials and we are going to do it on our own. You don't have to worry about any of these things. We will do it voluntarily. And at the last day, before the exhibition, we had to take photographs. One of our clerical hands, uh, who, who was uh, conversant with masonry work, worked until 3 a.m. in the morning with masons to complete the house and to take photographs following day. Everybody in the organization did something for the house. One person did a website for the house. Uh, another person built a model house. Uh, another made posters. Uh, somebody calculated the, the rates, uh, quantities for each wall panel. And uh, some people went to the Moroto University to test the wall panels. So all of a teamwork. And finally, when we went to the next construct exhibition, our stall was full of people. And at the end of the exhibition, we were selected as the most popular stall by the organizers. You can see the turn. One shirtless guy having a crowd at the end of the day. And one director who was all alone in a stall was with full of people finally getting an award for popularity. Now, that is the comparison I would like to make. Now, my friends, I would like to ask what are the learning from points from here about leadership? I want you to talk. Yes, please. Chintaka. If you have listened to this, what are the learning points that you take home? I know many people ask, they are to be failures. And they, they feel that if you ask a wrong question or say a wrong statement, they would be considered as failures by the rest of the crowd and they think it is best to keep quiet. No, I want you to come out. Oshadi. Virasin. Any learning points? Are you there? Have I lost my audio? No, sir. We yes. Please, somebody. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. You, uh, as the time passes, passing, I will uh, tell the learning points myself. Lead by following someone. Now, apart from me, who was the other most critical guy in this whole process? Architect. Yes, the architect, Kishan Sugatapal, who came with the plan, who joined me in the effort. Not, not in terms of words, but in action. He was the leader. He led me by following me. Without me, without him, I don't have a story to tell you. And 
This next one, give people a platform to perform. Listen to their ideas, observe what they deliver. This, that is what I did. Engineer was doing work with carpenter, clerk was doing masonry work, landscape people were doing it. I created the platform. They did it. Okay, third, enjoy their performance. I was enjoying their performance. Appreciate. I appreciated everyone who contributed. Kishan was appreciated by just adapting the same thing. Give them credit. Give opportunity for people to earn credit. Shinta uh, Jaising and myself, we finally uh, wrote a journal article and that was uh, uh, published in a journal. And uh, we also wrote to ISL uh, and uh, our paper became the best technical paper for the year. So there were so many opportunities from people around. Then uh, the most important thing, which was not there, but you should remember, take the blame. Give credit to the people, but if there was any problem, take the blame. A failure, you should take the blame. Now that is the leadership behavior. Uh, okay. Now, but if you look at the leaders, uh, you, do you find people who take credit for the work of the team? and transfer the blame whenever there is a slight failure. Now that is what you should avoid. Okay, uh, now uh, leadership part is, uh, we will just uh, keep it aside and come to what motivates people. Uh, because I, I will not, uh, uh, I will open uh, I would like to you to question at any moment because whenever I open the forum, you have not make use of the opportunity. But uh, if you feel that you need to clarify something, uh, please always unmute your mic and then interrupt me. That's okay. What motivates people? Uh, no, there are a few theories. We will look at these theories and then come to, uh, then use, apply, apply these theories to our uh, conditions. Now, the first theory I would like to introduce is the Herzberg two-factor theory. Now, uh, what he says is there are influencing factors. One set of factors are responsible for creating dissatisfaction in us. There is another set of actions that will create satisfaction in us. Okay. One set of activities creating dissatisfaction. They are called hygienic factors. Then there is another set of activities which create satisfaction. They are called motivating factors. They are two different segments. Uh, according to Hersberg, if you have, if your hygienic factors all are okay, you remove all the dissatisfaction of the people, but still you may not create satisfaction. For that to happen, you have to introduce the motivating factors. Lanka, we mean, now in, in people in Sri Lanka, it's very difficult to uh, understand these two concepts. Why? Because we consider not bad as good. If you ask somebody in the Western world, how are you doing? They would say, I'm fine. But in our part of the world, we say not bad. That means we equate not bad as good. Now, even when you go to temple, you say refrain from bad acts. 
but you never promised to do good deeds there. Until for the pahi niti ne, e pahi mo kudha karan ne, varadi deval nokari na akela porundu ne. Apu porundu ne ne honda veda karan akela. That's a different thing. So satisfying factors are different to dissatisfying factors that we have to understand. Though culturally we are not tuned to that. Okay, important. Now, if you, if I if I give these are the influencing factors. So normally in a lecture sense, I would give the group to identify what are the hygienic factors, what are the motivation motivating factors. We don't have time for that, and we are not physically meeting. And therefore, I am going to list it for you. What are the hygienic factors? Company policy and administration, supervision, work conditions, even the salary. Remember, even the salary, relationship with others, status, security, job security, all these are hygienic factors. If they are good, people are not dissatisfied. But people not be still satisfied unless you create these motivating factors: achievement, recognition, work itself, responsibility, advancement, growth. Let me tell you a small uh, episode. Myself and my son. I want to get my uh, home color washed. So I want to get the assistance of my son. What I could do is there there will be a painter tomorrow. Why don't you go to the hardware stores and buy some paint? This is the type of paint I need. I need four liters of this and four liters of that. So I give money to the son, and he has to go and collect the paint buckets for me to be given to the painter who will be coming tomorrow. Okay. Instead of doing that, I could give him money, tell him that I want home to be color wash. This is the money I have got. You can do the color wash in in a way you like. It is your responsibility. I don't. I don't. I will not ask questions. You can get your friends to come and help you, and save some money, and at the end of the day have a party. That is okay with me. But only thing is, you have to do the color wash. I am giving you money and the full responsibility. Now these are two different assignments. One is a boring work, mundane work, trivial work. Other one is a challenging job. It allows for achievement. It allows for recognition. Work itself is challenging. There is responsibility. So once you do that, you are you can be advanced. You will train to be a painter, and there is potential for growth. You can work with a team of friends and try to achieve something. Leadership role. So you can see, in an organization, we can create motivating factors. Not only hygienic factors, but also motivating factors. If you look at these two, this is the this is the process. If the hygienic factors are okay, nobody will leave the organization. They will all stay. But if they are not okay, they will leave. Like your son, if the if the if the home environment create dissatisfaction he will leave but if you remove all the dissatisfaction factors he will still stay in the organization he will stay in the house in home but like a body border ap kiyan uta idea the boarding car ek wage inne kiyala stay in the house but not happy not satisfied if he is dissatisfied he will leave and go somewhere and reside and live alone no he will not do that because he is not dissatisfied 
His dissatisfied factors are removed from home. I have taken care of those things. He has a nice room, all furniture, everything is there. But motivating factors are absent and therefore he behaves as a holding career. But if I provide responsibilities, like what I was telling you, those are motivating factors. They will work. Otherwise, they won't work. They will not support any of your work because you are only giving trivial work, mundane work, repetitive work without responsibilities. They won't be happy. Now, this is what you need to understand. Okay. Now I want a response from you. Why do you come to work? Is it because you have nothing else to do at home? Or you are being forced to come by your wife or your mother? Why do you come? Please. Anybody, please respond. Jai Singh, why do you come to work? Nobody knows. It is. Yeah, please. To earn money. Exactly, to earn money. Yeah, self satisfaction. Yeah. Their okay. self-satisfaction. Exactly. You, you do something and, and get a satisfaction out of what you do. You come for that. So there are various reasons why you... Thank you for all those comments. Very valuable. Yes. These are the reasons why you come. Basic physiological needs. If you get a salary, you can pay your bills, you can buy your food, medicine, shelter. Yes. And, and if you are getting a very good salary, you can invest something in fixed deposit or, or in, a, in a company or somewhere and you get security. If you don't have a pension job, pension job is you have a job security. So that means you not only look for food, shelter and medicine for today, but also continually, the supply continually. That is security. So we do a job, not one month, but continuously because of this. Somebody said to achieve something, self-actualization. Yes, belongingness. Some people come because they want to be with the crowd. They meet friends when they come to the office. They have social acceptance when they are there. Some people come because it's a, it's a esteem job. You have status. When I wanted to retire prematurely, my wife asked me, oh, how am I going to introduce you to my, my friends? Retired person, don't retire now. A job carries a certain amount of esteem, status. Now, this is the whole thing is jumbled here. We have to arrange it in the right order. When we arrange it in the right order, we find, sorry, Sorry, uh, before that, before arranging it in the right order, I would like to ask this question from you. NASA decided to pay $18,000 to stay in a bed for 70 days. This is what you should be doing. You get $18,000 is, is a big money. But you have no outside contacts. You don't have a phone. Now they are simulating what will happen in a, in a space station. This is how you have to stay. Nothing to do. Will you be happy? You're getting a salary. A good salary for that matter. You won't be happy. Very few people come. That is why they have raised this to $18,000. Of course, some of Sri Lankans will go because of the situation right now in the country. But in USA, they have, uh, they have found it 
uh, difficult. That is why they have given this amount just to stay in the bed. Okay. Why people need all this? Not just food and shelter, not job security and a pension and a, a secured life, but be a social element, have some status, recognition, and also do something and be a useful person to the country and to the other colleagues. So Maslow uh, was different to Herzberg. He said, these are the needs of the people. And he arranged it in a pyramid form. The base is physiological needs. Somebody who satisfied the physical, physiological needs only will look for safety and security. Those who have satisfied these two will look for belongingness. All satisfied esteem, all satisfied self-actualization. So it's like a step in a ladder. But why a pyramid? The base is, this is where the large majority of people stay. Few people reach this. That is what Maslow hierarchy needs says about. My next question is, if you give a salary, can you achieve not only physiological needs, but all this, all the rest of it? Can you? Safety? Yes, if you get a very high salary, you can invest that money in fixed deposit and have a pension fund. If you give money, enough money, you can buy a bottle of whiskey and call your friends. They will come flying. Your belongingness you need to be satisfied. You can throw away parties. What about esteem? You can buy a BMW and uh, or, or Volvo or whatever the esteem cars I am not very familiar with, but you know the brands, V8 and all that. You can buy it and then uh, esteem. What about self-actualization? You can buy it for money. If you have, I'm sorry, yeah, that, that, that is a difficult thing. But still, if you have money, there is room for self-actualization. Room for self-actualization. Self you can, you can uh, uh, enjoy a hobby and all that. Improve your skill set. Now, what the problem is, no organization is capable of giving a salary package capable of meeting all these needs. They can give a salary package to satisfy this need. What about the rest? That you may have to organize work so that people get opportunity for self-actualization, so that people are recognized so that people can belong to a team, a proud team. Like the clerk who worked until 3 a.m. in the following day morning because they, he felt belonging to the CHPB team that was building the model house, coming up nicely. Okay, so this is one Thing that I would like to share with you, uh, another uh, motivation theory. The important thing is organize work so that all these needs are fulfilled. Right. We go for the third theory. Sorry, before that, we can compare Herzberg and there is certain amount of uh, overlap here. If you look at uh, Herzberg, uh, uh, what are those uh, hygienic factors? They are here, salary. Almost these are here. When you uh, come up here, you, you see the motivation factors, recognition, self-actualization. So hygienic factors down at the bottom, motivating factors at the top. Growth is a motivating factor. Hygienic factors are for survival. So you can see some comparison between Herzberg and the Maslow. And therefore, we are not very far from each theory. Right. Okay. 
Okay, then we will skip this. Uh, then the next one is most people are motivated for different reasons, uh, for same reasons, but not always. Sometimes, normally it is for same reasons. So we can apply the two, two theories, Maslow and Herzberg, but not always. So therefore, when you want to assess rewards, what rewards to be given to motivate people, you should look at how a reward would be valued by a person. It may change from person to person. It may change from culture to culture in case of a group. What is applicable in a Western sense will not be applicable in a Sri Lankan sense. It, should, it could change from situation to situation. Maybe at one particular age in your career, you may have certain needs. When you grow up, you may have another set of needs. When you are about to retire, you may have a different set of needs. So depending on the situation, rewards can change. Some you may value at the very beginning of your career, but not at the end. So we have to look at these things, the changes. The first two theories are general apl applicability. But this one has an applicability depending on the personality. Okay, if I, am, if I ask you a question, what is the most important three days in your life? What is the most important three days in your life? Somebody can say the day I met my fiancé, uh, the day, wedding day, and the birth of my first child. If somebody gives those three, I would classify him as a person having a strong affiliation need. Affiliation is relationship need. He want to belong. Okay, somebody telling the day I became a prefect, the, the day I got a job, the day I was promoted, I would, I would consider him as a person having a very powerful power need. If somebody says, the day I pass the exam, the day I uh, complete color in colors, the athletic need, I would consider him as a person with achievement. Because each person is stimulated by different position in his character. Some are by power, some are by achievement, some are by affiliation. And if you reward a person with a strong affiliation need, with a promotion and a transfer to a remote area, he will not be happy. Even though you have promoted him or her. So you have to be careful. In personalizing the rewards, that is something you have to note in the motivation theory. Now, if you again, I'm going to combine this with the Maslow top three belongingness, esteem or status, self actualization. Those are the three. According to Maslow, few people reach here. It's a, it's a ladder like thing, but according to the Needs theory, I think this is by McClellan. Uh, this is about uh, uh, different personalities having different center of focus or center of focus. So you have uh, two theories generally applicable. Another theory, depending on the person, depending on the culture, depending on the probably the situation, they can change. But you can identify. You can align your reward to suit the person, to suit the group, to suit the situation. Okay. One more. In an organization, there are self-starters and push starters. How do you motivate these two people? Self-starters are people Again, our car, when you start with a, with the key, the car can start. 
but there are certain vehicles you have to push some need to be pushed a long way some with a small push they 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 go by so uh, so both the varieties of employees are there in organization for self starters who have initiation you have to give space and freedom uh, for push starters you may have to guide and supervise closely but if you mix up these two you are going to be in trouble they will if you if you use guide and supervision to self starters their innovation their initiation will be lost if you give space and freedom to push starters they will never work so when you apply leadership try to see who with whom you are dealing with this is important factor now all these theories are about absolute motivation but is motivation absolute or relative are you interested in your salary alone or the salary that the person sitting next to you get also some people will say i am interested only in my salary but it is not true most people are not only interested in their salary but also interested in what others get that is what there are conflict between doctors and nurses conflict between engineers and technical officers so many conflicts between private sector and public sector because of this equity equation we are not asking for a equal salary we are asking for a equitable salary remember these words equal salary and equitable salary now according to equity equation my reward divided by uh, my effort should be equal to others reward divided by others effort if this equation is not there valid if say instead of the equal sign if there is a unequal sign either way there will be problem if other rewards are divided by other efforts are higher than your one you will have a problem about the organization company policy and administration is not right you will resort to certain actions to make this correct what are the actions possible you protest you go for trade union action other thing you think why should i make this amount of work i will do less work let the people who are get paid do more work so you reduce your effort to make it equal number 3 if you cannot reduce the effort you have to increase your rewards if they don't give you steal rob third option fourth option is to go somewhere else where the equity equation is applicable so people leave can't leave the country people leave organizations to join other organizations where equity is there so important consideration not the absolute value but the relative value is important okay we have now enough theories about what motivates people any question with regard to this particular session k30 has unmuted i think you have a question K thirty, Kerala, Dagan, ah, he has muted. Sorry. 
if you're happy with the what motivates part, we can go to the next one, how to motivate. The uh, How to motivate the most primary theory is stimulus response theory. You reward the particular behavior, they will repeat the behavior. You punish, they will avoid it. This is called the carrot and stick approach. Carrot for good work, stick for bad work. The most primary theory. How to motivate? What motivates? Neve? How to motivate? How to motivate? Reward. Reward the kamuna vage the kene kene what motivates me? The reward type comes from the content theories that we discussed earlier. Now, this is, these are called process theories. How to motivate? Okay. Are you agreeable with this theory? We can apply when I'm We have capital punishment for certain uh, illegal activities. Have they gone down? Not really. People still, still have punishable behaviors. Why? Because this theory has limited applicability. Limited applicability. Why? If behavior is simple, if you don't have to do much, yes, they will do it. If behavior is complicated, then it's different. It does not involve a cost. You don't have to incur additional cost to behave in that fashion. Then you behave according to stimulus response theory. But otherwise, no. If the reward or the punishment is significant, you will behave. Again, again, capital punishment gain. That is why there is a huge cry in the society to bring capital punishment. When you when your punishment is huge, uh, people will behave. Do you agree? Again, there is a doubt. Now, this particular theory is called the cost-benefit theory. We will look at the cost-benefit theory in bit detail. Cost. What is the cost I must incur to behave in this fashion? What is the opportunity I, I lose? How costly is that loss? Now, take an example. You are giving a reward of 3,000 rupees for punctuality. That means you have to come at 8.15 every day of the month and wait until 4.30. Uh, the official times are 8.30 to 4.15, but you have to come at 8.15 and leave at 4.30 to earn this allowance of 3,000 rupees. Will you take it? If behavior is simple, if you are living in the quarters next door, you will definitely come because behavior is simple. And it does not involve a cost. Whether you come at 8.30 or 8.15, it doesn't involve a big cost. Of course, if you, you may save some uh, data in your quarters or some power light air conditioned if you are using. If the reward to the punishment is significant, is it significant enough 
for an engineer to be attracted. Some engineers may be, but other engineers who have other lucrative business, they will consider this as rubbish. If you have got a bad do Budale, inherit property, income, you may not bother about this 3,000 rupees. Insignificant. So you can see how this is applicable. Yes, 3,000 rupees is an incentive, reward. But whether it is applicable depends on so many other factors. So that is why we need to do cost-benefit. What is the cost-benefit uh, talk about? What is the cost I must think? Now, to come at 8.15, I have to leave home early. 15 minutes is not good enough because every day I have to come to earn that 3,000 rupees. So I have to at least make sure that I plan to come at 8 o'clock. So half an hour early. So that means I have to put my lights on early in the day. light done. There's a cost to my electricity bill. Okay. What is the opportunity lost? When I come home to, to, to reach my destination at 8.30, I usually meet a girl next door. Now, if I have to come early, as an early bird, she will not be there. I will miss her. Opportunity is lost. What value do you give it to give it to that? Okay, if I give a decent example, I, I take my son to the van in the morning. If I come early, I cannot do that. I have to get ready. So I miss the chance of being with my son. Opportunity lost. I will calculate all that. How costly is the lost? Can it be com com compensated with I get? And it could a benefit kata. Is it significant? Ha, mama then, I, I miss my son every day. But if I get good good amount of money, I can take him to a to some place during the weekend. That would be better. I can ask somebody else to take my son to the van. And I can pay the person with the money I get compensated. So how do I value the report? Do I value 3,000? Is, is it something I consider worthwhile? In relation to the cost. So there's a cost-benefit analysis calculation that uh, happened in our mind. Okay. Now, if the benefit is higher, rather than the cost, I will go for 3,000 rupees. If I'm living next door, I will definitely go. Otherwise, maybe not good enough. There is one more hitch. Now, if you look at cost-benefit calculations, the best deal is to buy a lottery. You spend only 20 rupees, the benefit you might get will be millions. So if you do a cost-benefit calculation, the best thing is you to buy lotteries. But rational-minded people don't buy lotteries. Why? They don't not only assess the cost-benefit, but they assess something else. There is limited applicability of a cost-benefit theory also. Why? If the effort ensures outcome, only I will do it. If I am living next door to the office, I will come. But if I am living far away, where I, had, I have to travel in a train, I will never go for it. Because I know there could be several days 
whatever I plan, there could be a delay in trade. I cannot ensure the outcome. Effort will not end up in a failure. So after spending all that money, losing, losing all the opportunities, if I don't get 3,000 rupees at the end of the month, I'm a failure. Now, these are the things you have to calculate when you are uh, thinking of how to motivate people. Not only you have to give the correct reward, but also how the reward is structured around what, around what behavior. This is an important factor. Now, why some children don't study hard enough? They know however hard they study, there is a level that can be reached. Okay, now you give him a reward. You tell him that if you study hard and enter medical faculty, I am going to give you a brand new car. For a young person, it's a very attractive offer. Reward is attractive. But will he go for that? He will look at all the people in the class, his rank, how many people have gone to medical faculty from the school, where he will stand, whether he will stand a chance. He will ask the parents, fly a kite. I don't want your, want your car. I'm not going to fall into this trap. This is an important factor. When you structure a reward, make sure that reward could be obtained, reachable, achievable reward. So the goal expectancy theory, this is the most uh, advanced theory. Yes, we take gambles. Decision making is all about a gamble. How much effort do I have to put? We assess the cost. Then what is the probability of me succeeding? Probability assess. Is there a fair chance of being successful? I, I don't need a 100% chance, but a fair chance. Rewarding is at the end of the day. How rewarding? Reward this assess. So cost benefit is the last, first and the last probability is the is one in between. So uh, rational minded people will do all that. And remember, when it comes to how to motivate people, you, you should look at all these factors. So the, the, these are called process theories. So if you really look at these are the process theories we discussed. First, the stimulus response, stick and carrot, cost-benefit theory. Then finally, the gold expectance theory, where we look at the calculated risk. That is how one is motivated. What motivates people is given by the content theories, Herzberg, Maslow, and Needs theory. So if you're asked to, now say in exam sense, if you're asked to explain uh, motiv content motivation theory and uh, say uh, apply uh, that theory to, uh, to, to, to motivate the particular uh, behavior. Uh, can you use these theories and explain? That would be a challenge for the exam. I, I'm not telling that these questions will be there. What I'm telling is, these are probable questions. Either you, they, the question could be from content theory alone, could be from process theory alone, or it could be a combination. So you should know your fundamentals if you are to answer. Any questions with, with regard to these two?
Okay. Now, if no questions, I'm going to the next one. So having discussed about motivation, uh, I'm now again coming back to the leadership. Is leadership a position or a role? If leadership is considered as a position, there is a specific person to fill up the position. And the position is associated with privileges so that it will be an attractive position. This is how normally organization, organizations work. But as a result, what will happen is position therefore must be defended because if you have a lot of privileges attached to the position, there is always threat for somebody to come up and grab your position. And therefore, you have to be careful. You have to protect from external people who would grab your position. Put you in nagitin and narakai. If you stand up and go outside on the room, somebody else might come and sit on your chair. That is something you should avoid. If you consider leadership as a position, but if it is considered as a role, Role is performed. It could be performed by anyone. And it is not associated with privileges, but with responsibilities. So therefore, not everyone will be willing to do it. The people who are capable will assume the responsibility. And anyone is free to perform the role. The role is interchangeable. Role is interchangeable. Have you seen how birds, migrating bird, birds fly? They fly in a V-shape. Do you know why they do that? The maximum effort is made by a person in the front. Under his wings, when he flapped the wings, there is an area that is V-shaped area where the, the air flow is minimal. And the other birds can fly without much effort because of this shadow created by the leader. And when the leader gets tired, he comes back and somebody else takes over. Role is interchangeable. It is a role with responsibility. And therefore, anyone can perform. And leader is not going to defend. Not associated with privileges. So how do you like the leadership would be in organization? Now, let's see how it works. It is better if we can change from position to role, but it is easier said than done in a society like ours, but that change is required. That is why require, that is what we require for the country today. Leadership has to change its role, not considered as a position. Okay. To defend the position, person needs to score over the others. Kesar Singhi Kavi because he needs to score over the others. But to perform the role, you have to maximize the scope of the team, not your scope. Team matters. You promote the team, not yourself. I told you the house was built by a team. My role was very minimal. And I did not want to defend my position. There was no need. Because I did not consider my position with privileges, but considered it as a role with responsibilities. 
you can you can consider you can change your mindset the person who performs the leadership as a role relieve himself of the burden of defending yes no no fear somebody threatening his leadership but if you look at our leaders you look at the history of the political leadership in this country what did you observe they always put a man or a woman who is incapable of threatening the top man who is incapable of threatening the first man the uh, top person ശ്രീമാൻഡാർ because it was a privileged position now this is where the country went wrong okay now we will look at the consequence of this when person needs to go score over the others what happens is he speaks more speaks first listen less try to dominate the meeting lanka we presidents la hitapu meetings ulta gana ogolanta theri mokada unne kiyala he speaks more speaks first listen less try to dominate very rarely he will ask question because the credit all the credit should come to him he may get a briefing earlier he will not a get a briefing in front of the others no but person who assume the role of leadership not the position he will speakless speak uh, speak last speakless speak last and listen more and try to facilitate others ogolo tekana me wede karanna bari unna because you 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 did not answer any of my questions and i had to deal with time but i would have loved to do that speakless and i love you to speak but this is not a exam sense i know uh, you are looking at exam material but remember this speak less speak last listen more and try to facilitate others why do you have to do that what is the advantage of that you should be able to tell when you speak last the other people can tell whatever they feel because you have not come out if you come out what will happen other people will tow the same line though they might have different ideas new ideas better ideas they will never come out because you have out you have spoken first so let them speak first let them get the credit if they have good ideas that is okay why do you search for credit if the team team wins you will eventually get the credit why do you have to worry speak less so that others have the have the time to speak listen more don't cut short people unnecessarily try to facilitate them people who are silent get them to talk right now but this will not happen unless you consider leadership as a role and not as a position
Okay, the last thing uh, about the position and role is the credit and the blame that I have discussed. So therefore, I leave it that a person who want to defend the position always take the credit and pass the blame to the others. But who is in a who is in a leadership role? He will take the blame and pass the credit to the members. That is the consequences of this. So if you ask in an exam sense, consider a leadership as a position. What are the bad negative consequences of that? If you consider leadership as a role, what are the positive consequences of that? You should be able to tell. Okay. Uh, there are different sources of power. Uh, legitimate power is something that you get with your appointment letter. Uh, the reward power is uh, uh, by rewarding people, you get this power. You have, you have the ability to reward, but until you reward, you don't get this power. So people who don't reward do not have reward power. Though they can they can reward at any time. They don't have the power. Coercive power is what? The people, the leader who punishes has the coercive power. Reward power and coercive power get uh, comes to you with the letter of appointment. But it won't be realized until you do that, until you reward and until you punish. Expert power is something that you get because of your know-how, your capabilities. Referent power you get from your qualities as a leader. How humble you are, how accessible you are, how, how listening you are, how you facilitate other people. That is how you get the referent power. So these are all sources of power that the leader can use. Okay, now the last uh, message that I want to uh, share with you, and this is an important message. Depending on the leader, the focus, there are three different kind of leaders. Uh, if leadership focus, leaders focus is on people, we call that kind of people, leaders as people oriented. What are their behavior like? Babala Vadaganna, Achyamalatte Kurutalli, Na Buriyatani, Na Pitra Tattu Karana. You send postcards, wishing birthday cards. All that is done. So they, they are people-oriented leaders. Their focus is people. If there's a funeral, they give a bouquet. Kadhe Malvadma kya? Likewise. Take for the birthday. People oriented. They wish. They remember birthdays very much and wish you. They are called political type of leaders. People who are in politics are normally have this capability, political type. People are inspired because he she cares you individually, individual caring. But a leader of a country or a leader of a large organization cannot do that. He can show his caring by way of exhibiting few episodes and video telecasting those things like what we see here. Yeah, but you know, it's it's, it's a harder thing for you to care everyone in an organization or a country. So you, you select key people. people. Uh, the second type is called work or task type. Task leaders. The third one is called the visionary type. I'm sorry. Yeah. The task leaders, uh, Premandas is one. Uh, Gota be Rajapaksi is another. Uh, not in all areas, but in some areas. 
Now Premadasa gets up at four o'clock and he calls meetings, tele give telephone calls to officers, and they are they have to be ready to answer. Uh, resource oriented person. Look at all the details. These are called supervisory type. They supervise going personally. They want results. Uh, with them, they can see immediate results and therefore people are attracted. So people are attracted for all three, three types for different reasons. Then the last one, institutional leaders. I think you know the person. He is uh, India's ex-president, Abdul Kalam. He's in a queue. Like others, rest of the people. Uh, he's not supposed to be in a queue. He can uh, make use of his political clout and get things done. But why he is waiting in a queue? Wasting his time. Why he does that? He's a visionary type of leader. He, wa he wants uh, all the Indian people to cultivate this discipline. Be in a queue. Wait until your turn. That is visionary type. It's not the people. It's not the task. It is the policies that matter. It is the long-term plans that matter. It is the value systems, processes, mechanisms, method structures that matter. Results are not immediately visible. It takes time to realize these things on ground. Results are not immediately visible. And therefore, people are not that attracted to this position. <laughs> However, institutions are built which will take over the task and look after people. The institutions thus built on this visionary leadership can take over the task and the people. The former two leadership styles. <laughs> Sorry. Now, in the Sri Lankan context, what is most applicable to large majority of people and the reason we are in this mess is we are we are we have bank on people oriented political type of leadership. What is the demand of the hour to get the country out of the mess? Institution orientation, system oriented people, visionary people. So this is the uh, this is the final message I want to tell you. Barack Obama, before going to Africa, claimed Africa doesn't need strong men; it needs strong institutions. He was of the view that strong institutions will change Africa. For Sri Lanka, we may have to modify it a bit. Over dependence on the individuals is where we went wrong. Individuals, we bank on individuals, bank on system and processes to deliver. This is the message I want to uh, make. Final message and leadership. Leaders should create such systems and allow those to work. Allow those to work, not intervene. Allow those to work. Now, that is the visionary type of leader. Now, uh, the final thing, I will finish this within another five to 10 minutes because I'm supposed to complete the thing within two hours. Uh, but uh, at least if I don't cover this subject, I will not, I will not be doing the, uh, doing the justice to the, uh, this particular topic area. Uh, but I, I have not covered some of the conflict resolution, arbitration, nothing, because in a two hours, you cannot cover everything. 
So decision process, if I just to tell you, first you have to identify the problem or the opportunity that you have. Find the cause or the background. Design a strategy, whether you are going to resolve the problem or to stay with the problem. Postpone it for time being, take it up later. That is the strategy. Then create alternatives. Now to create alternatives, the leadership has to uh, listen to people, uh, allow people to speak first. So all these are connected. Decision make process connected with leadership, leadership connected with motivation. So all, all has a link. Creating alternatives is not good enough. You have to analyze alternatives. When you analyze, you have to think of cost benefit. You have to think of probability of success. The risk, risk analysis has to be done. Okay. After analyzing the alternatives, you select the best. Decision process is not over. And this is only selecting the decision, but this has to be implemented. Before implementing the decision, you have to sell it. You have to sell it to the people who are going to implement it. Otherwise, the best decision will not be implemented. Sell it means what? You have to convince the people about the about the uh, the cons be better consequences of the decision. Okay, once you sell it, get a feedback. Ask them whether how how do they feel about it, and you refine it, improve and resell it. Keep on selling it until they 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 are convinced, because they are the people who are going to be going to implement this. Last one. Implement, sorry, not the last. Implement, implement. With implement also, decision process is not over. You have to monitor, see whether it is going according to the plan, whether there, are, there has to be any modifications. You have to go back to the first place where you identify the problem, whether you have identified the problem rightly. And again, come back if there is a problem. Once you complete the implementation, you have to evaluate. What do you mean by evaluation? See whether the expected results were realized. If not, if not, refine. Now say uh, you built a res irrigation reservoir and you find people don't come to cultivate. Why? There's a wild elephant roaming around the area. You need to have an electric fence to complete the project. To realize the project object, you have to refine. That is done after evaluation. Then learn for future. Not all our decisions are right, correct. There may be wrong decisions. Whenever you take a wrong decision, and you find that there is no way refining it. And you have, you have mismanaged the whole thing. Learn for future. That is how people learn. So you can see decision making is, is a process. It's a cycle. Uh, uh, and all these steps are important. And leadership is the, the one of the primary attributes is of leadership is to, uh, to, to master this decision process so that uh, uh, you, you cover everything, right? Uh, now with that, my contents are over. Any questions? Uh, uh, sir, regarding... Yes. I'm sorry, you, your voice is not clear. It breaks. Yes. Can you try again? No, my dear. It, it doesn't work, work that. If you have any questions, uh, why don't you uh, make it in a chat?
Uh, anybody else? Any questions? You can write the questions in the chat, chat also and see whether I can answer those. I think this record, this is this has been recorded, and probably this will be in the IES website, and you will be able to refer it again because some of the things you may have to uh, listen uh, again and again to absorb. Uh, so, if you have no other questions, uh, I will conclude the session here. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, good listeners. Thanks.